Hello and welcome to my special uh, lecture on groundwater provenance of a special place in Nevada. Groundwater provenance generally refers to determining the source of groundwater and that involves then of course where it's uh, flowing from and then ultimately uh, we're interested in where it's flowing to. So determining groundwater flow paths and sources of groundwater in the ground. And the special area that I'm going to talk about is uh, Nevada uh, National Security Site, NNSS, which was formerly known as Nevada Test Site, NTS. And I can refer to it as Nevada Test Site because it's lodged in my brain as Nevada Test Site. Um, this is a special lecture. Um, it's technical in nature, but I'm adding it to my roadside geology course. Um, and uh, just hoping that maybe those students can uh, bear with me um, as uh, some of them will, will get this and some of them might not be interested but at any rate uh, the photo on the right there is of me uh, lecturing in a place called Reveille Valley and I'm doing a lecture series uh, traveling up to Lunar Crater which is not too far north of here and lecturing about the glacial lakes uh, pluvial lakes they they're, they weren't they weren't bounded by ice but they were uh, during the Pleistocene period there was a uh, pluvial or rainy climate that uh, made many of these basins were filled with lakes including uh, glacial lake Reveille or pluvial lake Reveille Pleistocene lake Plu uh, Reveille and all that's left of it uh, right now is a salt flat in the background there and this is uh, where I left off a lecture on uh, my current position in this lecture series going up to Lunar Crater. And so I thought I would use this to segue into this lecture. This map shows the extent of the Pleistocene pluvial lakes in the state of Nevada. Uh, these are the borders of um, California and Nevada is here, running north-south here and then bending and trending to the southeast like that. That's all California, Nevada. Up here is Oregon. Uh, over here is Idaho. And here is Utah. 37th parallel, 37 lat latitude right along here is the border between Arizona and Utah. So uh, the border between uh, Arizona and Nevada then is just off the map down here. So zooming on this map, now, uh, the Reveille Valley and it's here. And these are elevations of the lake floor, 1512, as opposed to 1484 and Lake Railroad. And the relevance to this discussion is that the uh, Paiute Mesa and Rainier Mesa, the Nevada test site, are here. And you'll notice there's two uh, basins in this region here. Uh, this one's Cowich Valley and this one's Gold Flat. And uh, there were playas in there. It's not mapped as glacial lakes. Lake Reveille is the southernmost lake. But there was likely at least a pluvial intermittent lake or playa wetland in this region during the Pleistocene. And that's the relevance to uh, this uh, talk, which is going to discuss the Paiute Mesa, the Rainier Mesa. This canyon coming down, and zoom on that again, this canyon coming down off of the, off of the uh, Paiute Mesa is the Thirsty Canyon coming down into the town of Beatty, just at the southern edge of this map. So I mentioned uh, earlier Gold Flat and Cowage Valley with the Paiute Mesa right here below that and Rainier Mesa over here. Uh, the relevance to this talk is we have two separate groundwater flow paths um, coming off of the Gold Flat and Cowage Valley uh, that seem to share geochemistry which is different from the geochemistry coming off of the mesas in blue here. And generally that difference is that the uh, water is strangely um, isotopically meteoric uh, isotopically light, which suggests that uh, from a cooler climate, uh, the pluvial period in the Pleistocene is most likely, uh, but it's also saline. And um, 
I've worked in this before in Michigan, working with uh, saline waters that had been in, uh, recharged by fresh glacial meltwater that then uh, dilutes the uh, salt, a higher concentration salt in the case of Michigan, it was brine. Here, we're suggesting that it's the salts on the playa floor that get dissolved in fresh water so that the water does not deviate off the meteoric water line. And then that explains this uh, flow path, which is light isotopic, meteoric, but also saline. So my presentation here is based on um, the Nevada National Security Site or Nevada Test Site, and which is a restricted area. The presentation is based on a poster at the National Groundwater Association, and it was entitled as you see here. I'll walk through the title in just a second, but uh, as a publication off of the Nevada test site, it had to go through what's called derivative classification review um, before it was released to the public because I don't work with classified information, but um, there's a possibility that in working in a classified area that you might uh, reveal something that though it's that it is not classified it might jeopardize information that is classified so it's usually not too big of a deal but you do need to have it reviewed by a derivative classification officer and uh, we follow the rules uh, unlike some politicians so my presentation is carbonate disequilibrium and isotopic groundwater provenance in faulted felsic volcanic terrain underlain by carbonate rock so quickly walking through that carbonate disequilibrium, I will uh, present a technique to show the level or the amount, um, a measurable amount of disequilibrium in the carbonate system between bicarbonate, carbonate, solid calcium carbonate, uh, CO2 gas in the vapor phase, dissolved CO2 in the, in the water, and pH. Um, along with isotopes, uh, stable isotopes in both carbon and oxygen uh, of both the dissolved CO2 as well as the uh, water molecule. Uh, these uh, isotopes, hydrogen, deuterium, oxygen 18, oxygen 16, and carbon 13, carbon 12, uh, serve as uh, provenance indicators. And we're, we're uh, lucky to have that data in the data set at Nevada test site. Uh, so th these two techniques, carbonate disequilibrium and isotopic uh, methods, stable isotopic methods, will um, give us groundwater provenance. It'll uh, detect regions of uh, similar groundwater source and similar groundwater flow paths. And that's occurring in a faulted, this uh, basin range area of Nevada's normal faulted. It's breaking up felsic volcanic terrain, so felsic feld feldspathic feldspar, uh, sialic, silica rich uh, volcanics, uh, which are uh, normally acidic uh, in Eastern United States. These, these types of terrains are normally acidic because the, the uh, rock has, lacks an ability to buffer uh, acidic atmospheric groundwater recharge. Uh, but in this case, the water is basic and that's part of the mystery of this. Um, it's a volcanic terrain, primarily explosive volcanics, pyroclastics. It's underlain by the Great Basin Aquifer, the carbonate rock, uh, per mostly Permian Age carbonates. Um, they form the top of the um, Grand Canyon area. Um, I'm the first author, Dr. John Hoagland. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my other authors. Uh, Ron Hershey um, has been working on uh, the aqueous geochemistry of Nevada test site for many years. He's affiliated with the Desert Research Institute, um, and uh, he's uh, retired now, actually. And uh, this is uh, it's an honor to have him on the paper. He's been working on uh, selecting the the major ion data for the site for for many years, and and uh, orchestrating the studies for for um, orchestrating the aqueous geochemistry stu stu studies. Irene Farnham is. She's with Navarro Research and Engineering and has been affiliated with the test site project for about 20 years, I think. Um, she uh, is an environmental chemist. She has done uh, quite a bit of work on trace element um, chemistry in the groundwater um, and has uh, 
does an extremely great job at administering uh, the chemistry databases um, in Nevada test site. Uh, chemistry data is an enormous database effort. Um, and Jeffrey Wirtz is a geologist who's been involved in uh, interpretations of the geology out at test site and uh, has also been in charge of field operations for, for many years, the drilling and the sampling. And lastly, to acknowledge uh, funding sources, the work was uh, funded by DOE ongoing contractual work as well as uh, grants that were administered by DRI through DOE. And these uh, TREDS contract numbers are listed here. I'm Dr. John Hoagland, and uh, this is my address and contact information. What I'm going to do, because I don't want to stray too far from what has been approved uh, for release, um, is present the uh, poster panels, uh, both text and figures. And what I'll do is I will show the uh, panel for uh, 20 seconds so that you can freeze frame it, maybe screenshot it, and then you'll have the text. Then uh, show the panel and narrate as, uh, as well as explain. Um, so a lot of this might be straight reading. I apologize for that, but it's to keep uh, within the bounds of what's been released. So this is the geological setting of Paiute Mesa and the surrounding regions. Over 70 years of groundwater study at the Nevada National Security Site, NNSS, formerly known as Nevada Test Site, NTS, provides some important insights into Great Basin hydrogeology and aqueous geochemistry. The geology of the Paiute Mesa, one of four areas used for underground nuclear testing and surrounding areas, consists of thick sequences of pyroclastic volcanic rocks related to the eruptions of three Miocene-Pliocene calderas. And these are the Black Mountain caldera here, the Timber Mountain caldera, this larger one down here, the Silent Canyon caldera complex is a little less well-defined. It's, uh, uh, as the name implies, a complex of three or four different calderas uh, but they generally correspond to this region up in here, Silent Cal Canyon Caldera. This region all up, all up in here is, is Paiute Mesa, and then to this eastern part is Rainier Mesa, which are two of the corrective action units uh, that were used for... Uh, they're not corrective action units, they were areas that were used for testing. And these calderas were intruded into pre-Cenozoic strata, which includes the Mesozoic strata, particularly the Triassic uh, and Jurac Jurassic deposits that that typically overlie the Permian carbonates. And then most of the strata in the region, at least in southern Nevada, is uh, the non, the pre-Cenozoic is uh, Permian and older strata. Permian carbonates uh, forming the Great Basin Aquifer. The pyroclastic volcanic rocks consist of primarily felsic pyroclastic volcanics, lavas, and ash flow tuffs, which overlie either the source calderas or pre-Cenozoic carbonate and clastic strata, separating or at the margins of calderas. Evidenced elsewhere in Nevada, pre-Cenozoic strata were involved in East Virgin Sevier orogeny thrust faulting prior to the intrusions. The Miocene volcanism was emplaced into coeval basin and range extensional faulting expressed as west-northwest the east-southeast structural zones, and north-northeast to south-southwest basin and range normal faults that displace the pyroclastic deposits. The, the northward trending fault systems cross-cut the calderas, as well as the west-northwest to east-southeast structural zones, which are likely associated with caldera emplacement. A buried significant structural lineament approximately 40 kilometers in length and roughly parallel to the Thirsty Canyon for which it is named offsets some of the fault structures. So I'll point that out here. This is the Thirsty Canyon lineament run here as these black dots. Some of the major faults that bound the system, um, like here's the Oxcar Fault, Greeley Fault, and an example of some of these zones, here's the Northern Timber Mountain Structural Zone and the Rainier Mesa Caldera Structural Margin. The Thirsty Canyon Liniment forms a margin that separates the younger Black Mountain Caldera 
from the older from the other older nested calderas to the east of the lineament. The Thirsty Canyon lineament is primarily identified with geophysics, especially anomalously high gravity and resistivity. Though of unknown origin, hypotheses include emplacement of more dense volcanic rocks or fault elevated structurally high pre Cenozoic carbonate clastic rocks at depth, which have high gravity signals. Pre Cenozoic Paleozoic carbonate rocks outcrop in the western flank of the Black Mountain caldera and near Oasis Valley at the lower end of Thirsty Canyon near Beatty. So the lower end of Thirsty Canyon is down here. And this is uh, the region around Beatty, Oasis Valley. This next uh, text panel uh, refers to both the geologic map that you were just looking at, as well as the a Piper diagram, which I'll be showing in the next panel. Faulting subdivides and largely controls the distribution of both aquifer hydraulic properties and hydrogeochemical facies. So we have a very heavily faulted uh, basin uh, basin and range setting here. And you can see that there are different fault blocks uh, that we have uh, bounded by different faults that uh, the fault blocks have different colors. There was a uh, reasoning behind that coloring um, or, uh, in terms of hydrogeochemical -geo facies. Water chemistry that was both grouped similarly. We didn't follow exactly the hydrogeochemical technique of, of keeping it strictly to the hydrogeochemical data to define the regions. Um, we looked at the, the totality of geologic data, including fault bounding blocks, um, physiographic areas with respects to the uh, uh, basins and the drainage system that's out there, uh, the, the, the mesa versus the playas versus the uh, canyons, um, and, and various other aspects went into deciding uh, which, which regions to uh, group together. So we use this we use this geological map then to color the uh, geochemical data on all of the remaining plots in this talk, including the Piper, Piper diagram shown here. Major ions trend on a Piper plot from a sodium potassium bicarbonate and member water to a water of mixed composition, and that can really be seen particularly on the anion diagram. You see this nice uh, trend. Um, from here, uh, which is on the end of the uh, sodium and bicarbonate, um, uh, sodium increasing uh, this this way, um, sodium bicarbonate corner is, is here, the sodium increasing in this direction uh, to 100%, the uh, bicarbonate in, uh, increasing in this direction to 100%, so the sodium potassium bicarbonate end member is here, if you follow the trend of the water, um, you can see green and blues, beiges, reds, and browns in the anion uh, ternary diagram. Cation diagram is a little less clear, but it does show the trend from blues and greens to browns. And then combined on the diamond of the Piper plot, you can, you can see the trend. This text panel uh, is co corresponds to uh, graphs of both the open and closed carbonate systems. For this part of the presentation, the, again, the geological map is pr uh, good for the first uh, opening paragraphs here. The felsic composition of the pyroclastic rocks on Piute Mesa offers very little acid neutralizing capacity for incoming acidic atmospheric recharge. Very little solid carbonate is present for buffering the felsic rocks lack divalent cation, thus rock weathering byproducts lack divalent cation oxides, particularly calcium oxide, that otherwise raise pH by hydrolysis. Hydrolysis by univalent feldspars is kinetically slow, so like your potassium feldspars, um, they, they do uh, hydrolyze to clays, but the reaction is kinetically too slow to be significant in neutralizing carbonic acid and natural atmospheric recharge. In other regions of felsic rock composition, such as New England, the pH of the groundwater is acidic. pH is uh, 5.6 in the atmosphere. pH is less than 5 with acid precipitation, and the groundwater is, is, is equivalent. Here the pH is commonly above 8 on the mesa. And again, the Mesa regions are the regions in green, primarily in green and blue in the map. 
Hoover, a paper in 1968 in the Geological Society of America Bulletin, has shown that zeolites and devitrification of volcanic glass further removes divalent cation from water and exchanges univalent cations into solution. So it, it uh, puts sodium and potassium into solution, takes calcium and magnesium out of solution. Thus, the combination of felsic rock composition and the presence of zeolites in volcanic glass have largely starved the water of divalent cation, meaning uh, has ta have taken a large part of the calcium and magnesium out of the water, resulting in the sodium potassium bicarbonate groundwater facies on the mesa. Hoover 1968 has also shown that zeolites, along with the devitrification of volcanic glass, also consumes acid. So in the process, it neutralizes acid. The bicarbonate is thus provided from the neutralization of carbonic acid from the zeolite, both initially from the atmosphere, the acid from the atmosphere, as well as additions of organic sources of CO2 in the soil and upper rock column, which adds carbonic acid. The bicarbonate data is plotted of the open and closed carbonate systems. Uh, here on the open system diagram, we're plotting the pH versus the dissolved inorganic carbon, forming the uh, left axis the alkalinity acid neutralizing capacity total alkalinity is uh is shown in the right axis here in equivalents per liter the dic is in moles per liter the uh, bicarbonate data is plotted ph versus bicarbonate um, on both open and closed systems which are also plotting ph dic and anc as presented in stum and morgan 1981 in addition to the carbonate equilibria, the solidus of both uh, divalent calcite, calcium carbonate that is, and univalent natron and nacolite are shown. So here is the solidus for calcite running through here on the open system. And so when calcium levels are high enough and dissolved carbons to make carbonate are high enough, you get solid calcite here, as opposed to nacolite which is sodium bicarbonate, um, and natron, which is sodium uh, carbonate. So those are much highly sol more soluble. Um, the, uh, as a result, the uh, solidus is in uh, regions of much higher concentration. In the normal presence of calcium, uh, the precipitation of relatively insoluble calcite which has a solubility of uh, roughly six times 10 to the minus three grams per liter, uh, suppresses increasing uh, bicarbonate in solution. Without calcium, the solubility of natron, which is much higher, 215 grams per liter, and nacolite at 96 grams per liter, orders of magnitude higher. This allows for buildup of bicarbonate in solution on the mesa. Bicarbonate data is a full order of magnitude higher than the equilibrium point in the green diamond. So we can see here that if we take the green diamond, we have the equilibrium point here uh, for the calcite in a carbonate equilibria system. And our data on the mesa is up here. It's a full order of magnitude higher than the equilibrium point, which is at one times 10 to the minus three moles per liter, where we get up to one times 10 to the minus two moles per liter. So again, the bicarbonate data is a full order of magnitude higher than the equilibrium point in green diamond here on the system calcite bicarbonate atmospheric CO2 system. Uh, and those ranges again are 0.01 versus 0.001. Here is the same system of data, but now close to CO2, which shows uh, just the, the changing between carbonic acid here bicarbonate here and carbonate here. This is the standard closed system, uh, closed, closed system, CO2 cal carbonate. Uh, and you can see the equilibria between the, the calcite solidus at this point plots like this. You see the green calcite occurs in this region up here. This is solid. And we have much higher order of magnitude um, in a closed system for noclite and nat natron. So we can have uh, sodium carbonate soluble up to this point, whereas calcium carbonate is only soluble up to this point. 
and that maximum in the bicarbonate in both systems is at about pH 8.1. So the pH of the maximum concentration doesn't change too much, but the stability of the solid phase is uh, uh, the, the sodium uh, bicarbonate is much higher and much more soluble than the calcium carbonate. In 1965, uh, Kenneth DeFees developed a plot that shows the working relationship between uh, dissolved inorganic carbon, pH, and, and the acid neutralizing capacity. This is often referred to as the alkalinity triangle, and he provided a, a diagram that shows how these should change together when the system is in equilibrium. Of course, that can then be used to, to test whether your data is in equilibrium or not. So here is the DeFees 1965 plot, which provides a summary of the equilibrium values, summarizing the equilibrium values of the alkalinity triangle relationships. The figure is strictly based on the mathematical definitions of acid neutralizing capacity, ANC, and dissolved inorganic carbon, DIC, and is thus valid for both the open and closed systems of any carbonate evolution pathway. Uh, acid neutralizing capacity A and C uniquely includes a pH term. Uh, um, uh, DIC uniquely includes a carbon dioxide term. And the rest of the carbonate components are shared between A and C and DIC, which results in contours of pH on a plot of A and C versus DIC. So these are the mathematical, the text shows the mathematical relationships that is discussed that the acid neutralizing capacity pH term in it, um, it can be formulated in terms of pH, and the DIC has a CO2 term. Uh, but the sum of the milliequivalents of bicarbonate and carbonate are shared in both definitions. The coevolution of ANC in the blue line and the DIC, the red line, on an open system, atmospheric open system, carbonate plot, as shown here is the purple trend on the DeFees plot because they trend together. So when you sum the, the uh, red and the blue on the open system, you get the purple trend here, which is uh, roughly uh, parallel to the maxima, uh, uh, the uh, 8.1 pH. If you look at the uh, values of pH, seven here and uh eight and nine here and the eight eight point one ph is in the middle so it roughly follows the trend of the of the eight point one uh contour ph contour when the system becomes closed and acid is consumed by some other something other than carbonate which is a situation with the zeolites uh, and volcanic glass the resultant ph changes occur without changing dissolved co2 so the dic stays fixed and the A and C moves along this line here. So that it doesn't move the DIC as usual with either solid carbonate or a gas phase. So it's i.e. a closed system with respects to DIC. Uh, the evolution of rising pH and A and C under the conditions of fixed DIC is shown as that blue closed trend on the DeFees plot. The result is disequilibrium, high A and C water with both high pH and supersaturated levels of carbonates, but undersaturated with respects to the levels of DIC, specifically the CO2 component, all with respects to the atmosphere, atmospheric open system, purple open trend. Um, so data plotted DIC and CPH may also show disequilibrium unrelated to the atmospheric trend if the system has not yet equilibrated to new sources of either hydrogen, hydroxide, dissolved inorganic carbon, carbon dioxide, or carbonate. Paiute Mesa data plotted as DIC, ANC, and pH show both types of disequilibrium. Most corrections of the equilibrium replot towards the atmospheric purple open trend. So if we look at any of the data on the graph, um, we have a value of DIC and ANC, which should have a pH of uh, of uh, on this contour it should have a pH of nine and, uh, of ten and a half between pH ten and eleven, but instead it has a pH of eight point two. So this is out of equilibrium. And what I've what I've done on the uh, Defees plot is shown where it would replot if it were in equilibrium for that level of ANC, and you can see that the DIC 
uh, is undersaturated. It would have to increase to get that pH to the equilibrium point for that given alkalinity. So this text panel also uh, corresponds to the preceding graph. So can uh, continue to look at the Defees 1965 plot. Deviations from the atmospheric purple open trend are most likely caused initially by pH increases with fixed DIC. So the zeolites and uh, i.e. by zeolites and volcanic glass along the blue closed trend. The result is an undersaturation of DIC with respect to atmospheric levels of, of CO2, which would normally go along the purple open trend. If and when the groundwater encounters solid carbonate, it encounters equilibrium levels of calcium and carbonate dissolved in solution. Under the undersaturation with respect to dissolved inorganic carbon from the incoming water causes the solid carbonate to dissolve, ultimately by allowing CO2 dissolution. Normally the reintroduction of CO3, the carbonate, um, which is shown here as the green vectors and along the trend of, a, of the green vectors, uh, and the subsequent re-equilibration exchanges between bicarbonate and carbonic acid, the cyan vectors, are parallel to the purple trend, buffering pH at about 8.1. However, when acid neutralizing capacity is in excess, DIC moves in the direction of the CO2 dissolution, which is the orange vectors. And re-equilibration along uh, CO2 dissolution, the orange vector crosses the pH contours with a subsequent drop in pH. As more calcium is introduced into solution, calcium carbonate reprecipitation occurs uh, along the green vectors. The pathways of precipitation of solid carbonate in the green vectors also crosses pH contours with a drop in pH. The result is a buildup of CO2 in solution with dissolved inorganic carbon in excess of atmospheric levels in the purple open trend and a drop in pH. Drill crews developing and sampling wells have often described effervescent water as water with entrained air. This is most likely due to CO2 degassing. Okay, so here's the next text panel. You can use those magnitudes of the differences between the equilibrium dissolved inorganic carbon and the dissolved inorganic carbon uh, measured at the point. Uh, to construct a DIC excess map. So uh, with, this, with this text panel, uh, I'll be looking at the preceding graph showing the defeas plot, uh, and then also it'll be referring to a map that you can construct using the scalar quantity, the difference between those uh, magnitudes. I should uh, reiterate the uh, definition of the DIC excess, which is contoured here. A DIC excess is the departure in moles per liter of the measured DIC concentration from the calculated DIC equilibrium concentration given the measured pH and the measured A and C. The amount of disequilibrium can be quantified by the magnitudes of the re-equilibration vectors on the Defees 1965 plot. DIC excess can be defined as negative for DIC undersaturation and positive for DIC oversaturation. Values of DIC excess for each well are contoured. Results show that the DIC undersaturation on Paiute Mesa and DIC oversaturation in Thirsty Canyon and other broad regions west of Thirsty Canyon lineament. The results show that DIC excess can be used as a provenance indicator based on the degree of flow path evolution and the contrasting geology of pyroclastic rocks versus solid carbonate. So this text uh, template corresponds to the next graph, carbon-13 isotopes, stable isotope signature delta-13C, delta taken from the bicarbonate versus one over the bicarbonate concentration. The additional use of stable isotopes of carbon from bicarbonate expressed as delta-13C can greatly assist the use of DIC excess in provenance characterization. A plot of delta-13C versus 1 over bicarbonate indicates the sources of carbon along the flow path evolution. A linear trend from light carbon, delta-13C, values less than minus 4, on the mesa from organic sources encountered during recharge to an infinite bicarbonate carbon source around delta-13C equals plus 2 at the y-intercept. That y-intercept corresponds to an infinite 
bicarbonate, where 1 over bicarbonate equals 0. And it corresponds to a value of delta 13C around plus 2, which is uh, from most likely from carbonate rock. In addition, the clustering of data is approximately centered on delta 13C equals minus 3 for water further down flow paths off the mesa. These are the lavender and beige data points. So for the plot, delta 13C versus pH, a plot of delta 13C versus pH shows that a, a clustering of data around delta 13C equals minus 3 uh, has a pH of about 8.1, the pH of the maximum bicarbonate in a closed carbonate system. This is uh, the dissolved intercontinental carbon excess measured as that scalar between the equilibrium point measured of DIC versus calculated DIC given pH and, and uh, A and C. A plot of DIC excess versus pH shows that the, cl uh, that the clustering of data around pH 8.1 was relatively close to equilibrium. So the DIC excess is around zero. This indicates that the water further down flow paths off of the mesa are equilibrating with the carbonate system. So as water moves off the mesas in blue and green, moves down into the carbonate system in the beige, lavenders, and reds, uh, it, it moves into an equilibrium and the DIC excess goes to zero. Plot of DIC excess versus delta 13C shows that the clustered data around delta 13C corresponding uh, equal to minus three. Uh, so delta 13C around minus three, this clustering here as a DIC excess also around uh, zero. Uh, so the equilibrium point then as a delta 13C carbon content of minus three so this is showing that there's a consistency between the carbon, the bicarbonate, and the delta 13C stable isotopes, um, the pH of 8.1 at equilibrium, and the uh, DIC excess. So there's some measurement considerations involved in using this technique. Analytically, each component of the DeFees DIC ANC pH plot is independently measured by different methodologies. The standard hydrogen probe measures the pH. The bicarbonate and carbonate alkalinity components of, it, uh, of the acid neutralizing capacity ANC are measured by titration. And the dissolved inorganic carbon is measured either by mass spectrometer, uh, which was done for us at Livermore, or by columbic CO2 analysis, which is typically done in commercial labs, after the sample is purged of CO2 using inert gas. Assuming that quality assurance, QA investigation, that is, of the uh, field versus laboratory measurements of both pH and alkalinity titration is conducted, and assuming the independence of the DIC measurement and the three components of the alkalinity triangle, DIC, ANC, and pH, are truly independent variables, then the disequilibrium difference DIC excess, represented as a vector on the DeFees plot, figure 5, should be considered a real phenomenon and not a QA issue. DIC excess is a measure of the imbalance in DIC for a given pH and ANC, where the DIC ANC pH point, the alkalinity triangle, would be balanced in either closed systems with fixed DIC or in open systems with equilibrium, in equilibrium with the uh, PCO2 atmospheric, including atmospheric PCO2s. Most commonly, the re-equilibration is in the direction of atmospheric PCO2 from which the water initially de deviated, but may require additional re-equilibration when the water is re-exposed to atmospheric conditions such as uh, drilling, sampling, site, or laboratory exposure of the samples. Under normal at open atmospheric conditions, the CO2 concentration of 400 part per million 
which by the way uh, now is 415 part per million as I record this and it was formerly uh, while I was an undergrad 315 part per million um, in air translates to a dissolved inorganic concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter at a pH of 5.6 in rain uh, with the proton condition uh, H plus equals bicarbonate. On the open system plot of figure 3 is the red diamond. If acid neutralization can occur to raise pH, including buffering from dissolution of solid calcite, bicarbonate levels typically rise two orders of magnitude to the equilibrium point with calcite at 0 0.001 moles per liter. 61 milligram per liter at a pH of approximately 8.1. But if calcium 2 plus remains saturated, the bicarbonate levels remain fixed at this normal concentration of bicarbonate due to equilibrium precipitation of solid calcite. If calcium 2 plus and other divalent cations are not present, bicarbonate levels can rise to significantly higher levels, limited only by the precipitation of the univalent carbonate minerals with much higher solubility. Protocols for standard titration of bicarbonate and carbonate alkalinity assume normal uh, levels of bicarbonate near calcite water equilibrium, where the DIC uh, excess conditions of 0.001 molar is the dashed red line. The bicarbonate part of the titration follows the corresponding blue dashed A and C line from the proton condition of Y1 where the CO2 is equal to the carbonate, negligibly at approximately minus 10, 10 to the minus 5, at a pH of about 8.28. To the bicarbonate equilibration, equivalence point, X1, at a pH of 4.65, with a standard cutoff pH of 4.5. However, when bicarbonate levels are much higher, as an order of magnitude or more higher, the titration should be adjusted. Assuming DIC, is an order of magnitude higher, such as the red line here, one order of magnitude higher, at 0.01 molar, the solid red line, the bicarbonate part of the titration would follow the, cor the corresponding solid blue A and C line from the proton condition Y2 there, significantly higher at 10 to the minus 4 but at the same, roughly the same pH, 8.28. But it would go to the equilibration point X2 from here to here during titration. So it would follow this line down to X2 when bicarbonate equals H plus acid at a pH of about 4.3. Even the equi equilibrium condition, even at the equilibrium condition, the remaining dissolved CO2 is significantly 10 to the minus 4.